Okay, uh, let's do this. So, uh, so far, what we have seen is God entered into a covenantal relationship with Abraham, right? And within this covenantal relationship or within this uh, com covenantal community, God made certain promises to Abraham. Okay, he promised that he would have descendants, that Abraham would have descendants, land, uh, and that God would bless the world through Abraham's descendants. And last week through Brother Ben, we heard in order for God to do that, he needs two things, right? Land and people. And in Exodus chapter 6, we kind of see the summary of this covenant where God says, I will be their God and they will be my people. Uh, the main point of this covenant or this particular uh, summary that we see is, you know, God will be their God throughout times and they will be his people. Now, there are two halves in this covenantal statement. OK, so the one half is where God saying, I will be their God. In other words, God is committing himself to do whatever it takes for him to be their God. Okay, God will do whatever it takes to be their God. And last week, we kind of saw what God did, right? The 10 plagues. He sent the 10 plagues and drew the descendants of Israel out of Egypt. And he's actually bringing them into a new land. He is doing his part of the covenant. But there is also the other half of the covenant, right? They shall be my people, right? They shall be my people. Now, God is going to keep his covenant. That is not conditional. Yet, as you read through Exodus from where we stopped and when we reach to chapter 20 or leading to chapter 20, you see that there is this conditional element. If an, if an individual is going to receive the promise of covenant, if an individual is going to be part of the covenantal community and receive the blessings in the covenant, that person must be obedient. They need to be obedient. You know, there are several passages that we can look uh, to understand this. But this morning, I want to take you to Exodus chapter 19. Our brother Justin took us through this passage uh, during worship. But I just want to uh, point out a few verses. Okay, let's look from verse 3 onwards. Okay, Exodus chapter 19 and verse 3 onwards. If you uh, don't have your Bibles with you, you can look at the screen. Uh, the passage is up there. It says, while Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles wings and brought you out to myself. Now, therefore, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, what happens? You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So what we really hear God saying here is this. Listen, you know, I am doing my part of the covenant, okay? I have brought you out of Egypt. I have borne you on eagle's wings. And because of what I've done, what should you do? You need to be obedient to my voice in order to receive the blessing, in order to be his treasured possession. And this is not really a new idea in the Bible, right? If you look from the beginning of times, Genesis, you see God gave a command to Adam and Eve, right? You shall not eat of this tree. Now, if you eat of this tree, you will die. You see that conditional element there. And always when God gives commandments, we as human beings... Or as his people, we can respond to it in two ways. One is in obedience. And obviously, the other one is in disobedience, right? So when we obey, what happens? We receive the blessings of God. When we disobey, we are cursed. And that is what happened in the Garden of Eden, right? Now, if you look at a good example, is the story of Abraham, right? When God asked him to sacrifice his son, he was obedient. And what happened to Abraham? God was delighted with that, right? It pleased God. And Abraham was blessed because of this. God's commitment to the covenant is unconditional. He will do what he has said he will do. But if you and I are to be part of the covenant, if the Israelites were to be part of the covenant, they were called to be obedient to the covenant. 
they were called to be obedient to his voice to his commandments and that is really the context of exodus 20 you know um justin kind of said when he shared that uh, tobin will take us through some of these things i would love to but uh, time won't allow because we have to look at 10 commandments not one or two there's 10 of them so i'm going to skip through all of that and see what is important for us to see this morning um but one of the most frequently asked question today is this does the 10 commandment matter to us today right you know, it's part of the Old Testament. Uh, we are in the New Testament times. Does this matter to us today? It's, it's something that bothers us always when we look at these laws and Ten Commandments. Well, Jesus had a few things to say on this issue. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 18, somewhere beginning of his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says these words. He says, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Yes, it does matter. You know, these commandments matters. The first four fifths of this Bible, this book matters to us. We shouldn't be ignorant to it. In Mark 12, you see Jesus um, having a debate, okay, um, with these Jewish leaders. And one of the scribes, seeing Jesus doing so well, came up to Jesus and asked this question. In verse 28 onwards, you see this question he asked. He looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, you know, what is the greatest commandment? Which commandment is most important of all, right? Um, you know, there are 10 commandments. And he's asking, which is the, the most important one? And Jesus in responded to him saying, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus does, did not end there, right? He went on to say uh, that you can't say the first without the second, right? The second commandment is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. You know, I believe that this particular passage in the New Testament, as we seek to understand the Old Testament and its relevance, especially the Ten Commandments, holds a very, it has a major significance. Okay, Jesus is really saying that, you know, these two commandments really summarizes the whole of Ten Commandments. Okay, two things that Jesus points out here is this, love your God, right? And the second thing, Love your neighbors as yourself. Now, how we're going to look at the Ten Commandments is in this way. We're going to look at the first four commandments in relation to how we can love our God the right way. This, the next half, that is the next six commandments, we're going to see in relation to how we can love our neighbors the right way. So the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments in Hebrew is called, the word is called Decalogue, okay, Decalogue. And the exact literal translation of the word Ten Commandments is not, uh, the exact translation of the word Decalogue is not Ten Commandments, okay. Deca means ten, and Logos means words. These are the ten words of God to the people of Israel. It's, it's ten words of God to the people of Israelites. It's good to hear myself. And God spoke these words uh, to the Israelites, and this is how he starts. Okay, let's look at verse 1. We read through it, but we'll just look at it again. Verse 1. The God spoke, then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You know, God starts with an introduction, right? He says, I am Lord, I am the Lord your God. Church, why do you think he uh, had to do this introduction to Moses? I mean, he's been speaking to Moses up until chapter 20. But again, we see here him, him coming and saying, you know, I am the Lord, your God. If you remember what we heard last week from God's word, we hear, uh, we understood the significance of the name Lord, right? Okay, quiz. What does the name Lord signify? Don't tell me, Philip, don't tell me the name of the Lord, okay? Uh, but what was the Hebrew name? Yahweh, right? The name Yahweh for the Israelites, you know, it meant something important, okay? It, 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 it 
particularly showed them to the creator of the world the one who took them out of egypt the one who took them out of slavery the one who redeemed them okay so he's saying i am that lord i am yahweh your god who took you out of egypt and here are my 10 words for you and you are to be obedient to these 10 words okay so here here are the 10 words that yahweh gives to the israelites first commandment you shall have no other gods before me you shall have no other gods before me only one god okay there's a reason i believe why this is the first commandment it's not because this commandment is better than all the other commandments the reason why it is the first commandment is because i believe this is the most foundational commandment for all the other commandments if we struggle to understand and be obedient to this very first commandment then we will struggle to keep all the other commandments to have only one god in our lives kevin de young uh, said like this the most important aspect of our faith is not how hard we believe but in whom we believe i'll repeat that again kevin de young said the most important aspect of our faith is not how hard we believe but in whom we believe the underlying issue as to why many of us struggle in our faith is because our understanding of the person god or the way we worship god or or even that exclusivity that relationship that we have with god is is feeble it's weak we struggle in that and that is why many times we struggle in our uh, relationship with god or to know god so how we're going to go through all of these commandments is in this way we're going to look at the what and some of them we look at the why and the how basically it means we're going to see what this commandment tells us um, why we should keep this commandment, why this commandment is important and how we're going to obey this commandment so the what the what is this worship god exclusively worship god exclusively it is important for us to understand what god just said in verse one and two you know god just looked at the people of israelites and said you know I, Yahweh, just brought you out of Egypt. I'm the one who saved you. I'm the one who not only created you, but I'm the one who saved you, who redeemed you, who brought you out of slavery. Therefore, you know, I have a claim over you. And therefore, you are to worship only me. Worship only me. Not any other gods. You know, during that historical time, there was a, there's a view called henotheism, which means you can have many gods, but whichever god you think is the best, you can worship that god. But the scripture teaches us monotheism. We heard that when Raven taught us, okay, there is only one god because there is no other god. He is the one who created the whole of creation, the heavens and the earth. And we are to worship only this god. But we have an issue, right? There are two issues why we fail to keep this commandment in our day-to-day -day lives issue number one is not because we don't know enough that we need god right we all know that we all know that we want god in our lives but the issue is this we always want god and something more right we want god and something else something more and this something more can be different for each one of us for some of us it can be a bank accounts for some of us it can be our jobs or whatever delights us right but God does not, you know, want to be treated as another God in your life. Okay, He wants exclus exclusivity in your life. He wants to be that only God that will be worshipped. And the thing is, sometimes we look at these something else or this, this something more to satisfy us. Brothers and sisters, let me remind ourselves that there is nothing in, 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 in this world or nobody that can satisfy the deepest needs of our hearts. Only God can. Only God can. And God has no interest to be another being or another important person among many. No, God wants to be ex worshipped exclusively and not to be worshipped alongside other gods. You see, all the other nine commandments speaks of actions you and I should do and shouldn't do. But this, this commandment mandates you know, a certain kind of relationship. It tells us how we are to relate to God as the only God. Only God. You know, a good analogy uh, to explain this commandment is uh, a husband-wife relationship or a conversation. This is an analogy, okay? By the way, husbands, don't try this at home, okay, what I'm going to say. Uh, just imagine the husband walks up to the wife and says, 
hey babe you know what i love you so much you're the most beautiful person that i've known you mean so much to me you excite me you you are my world uh, but you know what this is another woman that i really like uh, and she is also beautiful she also excites me and i think you know three of us you know we can have a great relationship and just imagine the wife on the other side like wow honey what a great idea no wife in their right mind would say that right she would feel jealous she would be upset right and none of us seated here would look at the wife and be like how dare she reacted that way right we would understand when she gets jealous because she is in an exclusive relationship with her husband so it is the same with god god has redeemed us god has saved us and god has made us his children and we are to have only one father and that is this god and we are to we are called to worship god exclusively no other gods the second issue why we struggle to understand and know this god or worship this god exclusively is because of sin right none of us are naturally born to love god we were reminded from the beginning of today's worship right we were born as dead in our sins when we were born we were born to love ourselves to satisfy ourselves everything in us wanted to make ourselves happy right but god through christ jesus changes that right in first timothy 2 verse 5 we see because christ redeemed us because christ died for our sins and whoever believes have eternal life now he is the mediator between god and me right jesus himself says in john chapter 14 verse 7 if you had known me you would have known my father also for now on you do know him and have seen him you know the implication from all of this is that if you don't know god in christ you don't really know god if you don't know god in christ you don't really know god the first commandment can no longer be properly obeyed unless we worship the one who alone shows us the true god so brothers and sisters if any of you seated here um is struggling to know god maybe a good place to start is asking yourself if you're truly repented of your sins and trusted in the finished work of jesus so how do we put this into practice how do we obey this commandment John Calvin gives us four helpful diagnostic questions to ask ourselves. He starts with this point praise. Whom do you praise the most in your life? Secondly, trust. Whom do you count on? Thirdly, invocation. Whom do you call for? Whom do you uh, whom do you look for answers? Thanksgiving. Whom do you thank? Whom are you most grateful for? You know, answering these four questions really helps us reveal the true gods in our lives. And anything apart from God will never satisfy us, and we are called to worship only God exclusively. Second commandment: worship God rightly. Worship God rightly. You know, um, God says to Moses, "You shall not make for yourself a carved image." And the second thing He says, "You shall not bow down to them or serve them." And I'm skipping the verse because we have already read it. um if the first commandment is against worshiping the wrong god the second commandment is against worshiping our god the wrong way okay it's about worshiping our god the wrong way we are not to make images to represent god in any form you know we are not to worship images of any kind you know the old testament is full of examples of people creating or god's people creating man made images for their self willed worship right and one of the most um, you know obvious story that you and i can remember is the story of the golden calf right uh, when you look and you will see that uh, in exodus chapter 32 you know and it's something interesting or something to remind ourselves is when aaron pro- proclaimed a feast he proclaimed it to yahweh okay and and the people declared that these were the gods who brought them out of egypt what we need to note here is this they are not worshiping the wrong god okay they are worshiping yahweh they are not worshiping the god of baal no they are worshiping yahweh but the problem was how they worship right they worship by creating an 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 idol in the image of god to represent god 
Another thing that we often find or another thing that we often do is this, that we try to take these religious symbols, or this is something the Israelites did as well. They take this, these religious symbols and think that these religious symbols um, will have some kind of uh, real powers. Okay, for example, something that you see in the book of Jeremiah is how they um, saw the temple of God, um, you know, when they enter the temple of God or when they are near the temple of God, they, they think that suddenly, you know, they have this certain kind of religious power happening in them. You know, there's a good luck charm uh, that comes with it. You can see that in Jeremiah chapter 7. And sometimes we do that too, right? You know, sometimes when we enter the church, we think there's this unbelievable power that happens in our lives. Sometimes when you stand in the pulpit, we think that this pulpit has some kind of significant power, religious power. You know, sometimes we have you know, um, chains with a cross on our neck. We think we, having that in our neck will have some kind of significant power. Some of us kiss it. You know, we do all of these kind of things. right? And what this commandment tells us is we are not called to worship God in that way. We are not to do that. The why. Why is this important? You know? Uh, one reason is because our God is a free God. Okay, Our God is free. When we have something to represent God as if it were God, then we are actually undermining God's freedom. In John chapter 4, verse 24, we see God is spirit. right? God is spirit. He doesn't have a body. It is not for us to make the invisible God visible. Secondly, God is a jealous God. right? God is a jealous God. And that is what we read in this particular verse Okay, um, he, he does not like to share his glory with another God. He cannot bear, even if it is our way to just show that, you know, whatever we're creating is just to represent and not to replace God. Even then, he does not like it. Thirdly, brothers and sisters, you know, God provides his own mediator for us. You know, sometimes, you know, when we have these, these uh, idols or when we have these images or when we have these, uh, what do you call, um, you know, these chains or whatever we call it, uh, you know, sometimes we think by having that or by looking at it, you know, we can get intimate with God. You know, there's this something that's special that happens. You know, it's easier to access God by that. Um, that's the wrong way to look at it. God has given us a mediator and that is Jesus, right? We can approach God through Jesus, John 1 verse 14 says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. So how do we um, obey this commandment? One, by guarding our hearts and minds against the images of God. Um, as you can see on the screen, it says guard against the images of God. But I wanted to push it, stretch it a little bit and say guarding our hearts and minds. It's not just images that we see, but even in our imaginations, we are not to have an image for God. You know, sometimes we think of this long bearded guy who comes and hugs us and that is God. We are not to do that. Secondly, we are called to turn to Jesus as the fulfillment of the second commandment, right? Jesus allowed humans to see God who cannot be seen. We don't need pictures nor icons. Jesus is our icon. He is the image of the invisible God. Colossians 1 verse 15. The interesting thing is that word image there, acon, we saw that again when we spoke about creation, is the exact translation uh, when God said he, we have created uh, us in the image of God. Okay, Representation. He represents God. We can know God through Christ Jesus. We can reach God. We have access to God through Christ Jesus. We don't need these images. We don't need these things to reach God. Third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who take his name in vain. The word vain here means empty, nothing, worthless or to no good purpose. Okay, It means empty, nothing, worthless or to no good purpose. You see, the why is this. To take God's name in vain is to take his character in vain. Okay? It is to take something that is wholly pure, something that we cannot think of. Okay, I loved the word Justin used this morning, nuclear, right? You know, you cannot act, you can't even reach this God. It is to take that name and use it like, you know, God is a buddy, right? Something so casual. So the what is this? 
we are forbidden from taking the name of God in a manner that is wicked, worthless, or for wrong reasons. If you look at that commandment, he said, you shall not take. We are forbidden to take the name of the Lord in vain. We are also forbidden to give false promises or empty promises in the name of the Lord. Leviticus 19 verse 12 says, Do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. So how do we obey this commandment? Don't use God's name carelessly. You know, Just don't use God's name carelessly. Some of the ways we use God's name carelessly is in common conversations we have with our friends or just for fun, right? Oh God, did you see that? Oh my God, did you know what happened? Right? Every time we take the name of God, we are actually associating that name to a person. Okay? And that is something that we need to remind ourselves. Another time that we sometimes take God's name in vain is when we pray. Right? You know, I, I, you know, I, I, this is something that convicted me and that is why I put this in the slide. Because sometimes when we pray, we just say all these theological things and you know, do we really mean these words? You know, we say, you know, God who's sovereign, God who's up there, God who cannot. You know, do we really mean these things? If not, we are actually taking his name in vain. Another time often we take God's name is in vain is when we pray for the food. When we see that yummy chicken biryani, we just say, God, thank you for this food and, and bless it and give it to us in your son's name. We pray, amen. Right? Do we really mean that this food in front of us is because of God's faithfulness in providing for our needs, and we are thankful for that. You know, we need to be careful how we use God's name. And if I had time, I would have loved to take you through some of the passages in the Old Testament where people used God's name in vain and they were stoned to death. Okay, that was the kind of punishment that was given in the Old Testament. And today, we, we how, how easily we use God's name, right? You know, brothers and sisters, we need to repent. You know, this name holds a great weight. And we need to understand that and, you know, call on God's name not in, with a vain, in, 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 a, in a way that is uh, in, in vain. The fourth commandment is to rest and rejoice, okay? Uh, God says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And I'm, going to, I'm not going to read the whole passage, but one of the things, uh, observation to keep in mind is God says, remember the Sabbath day. You know, many people believe that the Sabbath day was instituted when God gave these Ten Commandments. No, he's telling them, remember something that has already been existing. Okay, so where did it start? We go back to the creation. God created the heavens and the earth and everything in it in six days and on the seventh day, he rested. Right? The fourth commandment is the one that reminds us how we relate to God in our worship. It says that God established a pattern in creation, a pattern of work and then rest. A time to rest for our bodies that gives us time to focus on worshipping Him. Now something that you and I should not misunderstand when we look at this commandment is this, that you know, we work six days and then on the seventh day we just worship God and all the other days we don't have to worship God. Don't, don't, don't think like that. We are called to worship God every day of our lives. Okay? Every single day of our lives. But rest is important because when we rest, what happens? You know, it helps us to just stop, pause, reflect and see you know, what how, what God has done in our lives and respond in worship to God. So the why is this, you know, when we don't rest, uh, we fail to rest in God. Okay, life can be overwhelming, our wor works can be overwhelming, it can be burdening. And we will forget that we have a God who is willing to carry a burden. Or there's a God who is willing uh, to be there with us. And rest is essential for a Christian. You know, Jesus says later in Matthew 11 verse 28, Come to me, all, who you, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Right? The most important way we can observe the Sabbath day is by just ceasing from our flawed, sinful things that we do and just to look to Jesus and find rest, rest in Him and trusting in Christ for salvation. So how do we obey this commandment you know here are some questions for us to think okay questions that will help us um, you know reflect and obey this commandment can you trust God to make up for the lost work on one day by blessing you on all the other six days 
I'll repeat that again. Can you trust God to make up for the lost work of one day by blessing you on the other six days? Another good question to ask yourself is this. Can you trust that this burden you're carrying, your jobs or whatever it is, is not yours to carry alone? And therefore, can you trust God to carry it and carry you if you have faith enough to stop striving and just start worshipping God the right way? When we fail to rest, we fail to rejoice in God. Rest is important. Fifth commandment, honor your parents and your mother that your days may be long in the land that your Lord God, the Lord your God is giving you. So far, all the commandments that we've been seeing specifically talks in relation to how you relate with God, how, how you can love your God. Now we're going to move to the next segment, how you relate with your neighbors. If the first commandment is the foundation of all the commandments we have seen so far, I believe this commandment is the foundation as to how we relate with our neighbors. It starts from your home, right? We often say this, right? It starts from your home. You know, Calvin says to honor anyone, there are three things that is re required. Reverence, obedience, and thankfulness or gratitude. Reverence, obedience, and uh, gratitude. And I'm going to take those three principles in relation to how we can honor our parents. We are called to revere our parents, you know, to show this kind of reverence. You know, our parents, uh, given the responsibility that God has given them, it's not easy. You know, there is this weight that they have as they've given this responsibility to, to uh, you know, to take care of us and to bring up us in the fear of God, okay? Um, you know, there is this office of great significance that is given to them. And we are called to honor them by just revering them, to showing reverence to them. Second thing is to be obedient to them. We are called to do what our parents, um, you know, say while we are still part of their household. It does not mean that when you leave your homes, you know, you can do whatever you want. Though the scripture tells us when you, one place it happens is when you get married, you're leaving and you're cleaving with your spouse. Uh, but brothers and sisters, you know, there is still a way for us to uh, obey our parents. Okay. And by obeying our parents, we are actually honoring them. Thirdly, gratitude. You know, gratitude is one of the chief ways we can honor our parents. The kind of work that they do for us, the way they sacrifice things for us. You know, one of the best ways we can honor them is by just being thankful and showing gratitude towards them. You know, we need our parents in our lives, okay? Um, they work for our good almost every single time, <laughs> right? They want the best of us. And in, in other words, you know, if you think about it, they're really one way God represents his love for you and me through our parents. So how do we obey this commandment? We obey this commandment through cheerful obedience. Okay? When they ask us for help or anything, say yes. Tell them, yeah, dad, I'll do that. Secondly, thankfulness. Thank them right, for whatever they do. In my home, when I tell my dad, 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 thank you for anything that he does, he gives me the stare. Okay? He's like, why would you even thank me? You know, there's no thank you in our relationship, right? Some parents don't like to hear the children say thank you because they think that is their responsibility to do it. But I believe that even when we say that one word of thank you, it'll bring one smile in their heart. You know, my son is grateful or my daughter is grateful for whatever I've done. And that's one good way to honor our parents. Another way is to say sorry. One of the most difficult things to say because oftentimes we think we are in the right and they're in the wrong, right? Uh, but I think when we say sorry, there is healing. Okay, there is healing. And I can say that from my own life. Um, fourthly, just to stop and being there for our parents. You know, stop everything that you're doing and just be there for them. You know, pick up your phone and call them and ask them how they're doing. You know, this is such a cliche for practical application, but I think these are powerful applications, right? Uh, just for them to know that you love them and just being there for them, just to tell them, hello, dad, hello, mom, how are you doing? And that is one way we actually honor our parents. So Philip and I, we were uh, talking about this commandment. Uh, and we were saying, you know, how there's one commandment about uh, how we need to relate with our parents. Um, and I looked at Philip and I said, it's, 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 it's interesting that there is no commandment that tells how you and I need to relate with each other. And Philip was like, what are you saying, Dad? There is a commandment. And I was like, which commandment, bro? And he said, there is one commandment that especially talks about our relationship. And without missing a beat, he said, the commandment is thou shall not murder. 
that, that's how he feels about me. Church, please pray <laughs> for me. <laughs> and that leads us to the next commandment. You know, thou shall not murder. The why. We are created in the image of God. We learned that from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 27. No matter what race, gender, ethnicity, or health conditions, or however we are created, God created us. And every person has inherent worth and dignity since each one of us were created to represent God. So the what. This commandment prohibits us to take human life. It prohibits us uh, to take human life. It prohibits premeditated intentional murder. It prohibits suicide and abortion. I wish I had time to go through all of these things. But we are not called to take anyone's life because we did not create this life. It is God who gave this life. Only he can take it in his time. You and I, we are not allowed to. We are prohibited to. But Jesus takes it a step further, right? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 to 26, Jesus prohibits all violent emotions and intentions of the heart. Jesus says, murdering is not just taking a knife and stabbing someone, but even in your heart, if there is anger against someone, you have already committed murder, right? You and I can be 100% free from murder, but still face the wrath of God if our life is marked with anger, insult, and rage. So how do we obey this commandment? One good way is asking others about your anger. You know, ask your brothers and sisters about your anger. It's important to keep in check to fix it before it gets out of hand. You know, scripture gives us a lot of uh, principles. You know, don't go to bed you know, without resolving issues. You know, don't go to bed with anger in your heart. The sixth commandment not only prohibits us to murder or get angry, but also encourages us to reconcile issues with our brothers and sisters. Right? Reconcile. If there are anybody in our lives that we are angry with right now, you know, reconcile. Because if you are not, you are being disobedient to this commandment. Seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. You know, I was talking to one of my a uh, friend uh, in the U.S. who is also an elder in his church. And we were having this conversation about the Ten Commandments, and I was just going through all these commandments. And he said, in my 11 years of being an elder, uh, about 90% of the really difficult issues that has come before the elders had to do with sex and marriage. And I'm sure many elders would agree to that. Right? This makes sense because one of the things that I've realized is this, that two of God's greatest gifts our marriage and sex. No relationship can be as intimate, sweet, life-giving, and joy-filled as the marital relationship. And no experience can be intimate and powerful within the marriage relationship as sex. So, of course, the devil is going to go after these two, right? Why is this important? You know, God established the institution of marriage as being between one man and one woman, right? Genesis 2 verse 24, Matthew 19 verse 5. God intended it to be a sacred union. And also through, it is through marriage that God designed the procreation of human race, right? And therefore, it is important for us to understand why God would give this so much weight Right For this commandment, you are not to commit adultery. You know, the dictionary defines adultery as voluntary sexual intercourse between a married person and a person who is not his or her spouse. And the Bible would conquer with this definition, right? In Leviticus chapter 18, verse 20, God told Moses, Do not have sexual relations with your neighbor's wife and defile yourself with her. In Deuteronomy 22, verse 22, we find a similar definition. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. However, it is important for us to understand that God not only you know, uh, commands that we should not commit adultery, but God prohibits all sorts of sexual sin, all sorts of sexual sin in the Bible. Whether it is incest, fornication, homosexuality, uh, we, that we see in Leviticus 18, all sorts of sexual sin, God prohibits it. In Matthew, God, uh, in Matthew, Jesus takes it even further. He says, right, we are not even have lustful thoughts in our minds, right? 
If we have, we have already committed adultery. So how do we put to practice this commandment? One, by fleeing from sexual sin. You know, running away. First Corinthians 6 verse 18. Secondly, Romans 13 verse 14. You know, make no provision for the flesh. You know, we are not to allow such thoughts to even come into our minds. If there are things that is you know, tempting us, avoid it. Make no provision. And so we move on to the eighth commandment. I know many of you are writing and looking at the screen. Don't worry. Ben will send you the uh, PowerPoint after the sermon. I need to run through all the ten commandments. So we're going to look at the eighth commandment, okay? Do not steal. Steal. So when we think of this commandment, we naturally think about all the robbers and thieves, right? That's what we always think. Of. That's the first thought, right? And we probably feel like, you know, we don't have much to do with this commandment. Um, you know, Heidelberg Catechism explains this commandment in this way. God forbids not only outright theft and robbery, punishable by law, but in God's sight, theft also includes all scheming and swindling in order to get our neighbor's goods for ourselves, whether by force or means that appear legitimate, such as inaccurate measurements of weight, size, or volume, uh, you know, counterfeit money, excessive interest, or any other means forbidden by God. So what does this commandment forbid? God forbids outright theft and robbery, okay? That we all know, that's the obvious one. God forbids stealing people, okay? This is something that happened in the Old Testament. If you look at Exodus chapter 22 and 21 and verse 16, uh, this is something that God forbids. He says, you're not supposed to steal people and use them as your slaves, God forbids robbery of personal property and persons. God forbids excessive interest. Okay, Exodus 22 verse 25. God forbids cheating the state or the government, giving bribes. All of these things come under this. God forbids plagiarism, stealing music, movies or softwares, right? Piracy. And God forbids all greed and pointless squandering of his gifts. You know, stealing with the eyes of your heart. God forbids all of those things. How do we put to practice uh, this commandment? You know, have a generous heart. Right? One of the ways we avoid stealing is by just giving. When we give, we realize that nothing we have is from God. And what God gives us, we give it off. Be stewards of what you have today. Whatever God has given you, be faithful to it. In a use it the right way. Don't think of having more always. And finally, set your minds on things that are above and eternal. Right? A good story to remember is the robber on the cross. Right? He looked at Jesus and he said, Jesus, we are here because of what we have done. We deserve this. But when you go to heaven, remember me. And Jesus looks at him and he says, uh, today you will be with me in paradise. You know, in that dying breath, you know, Jesus gave this man a promise of an inheritance that he, that this man would have, you know, all his life went seeking by robbing and stealing to satisfy himself. But God, Jesus gives him a better inheritance, right? That will not defile, that will not fade away, kept for us in heaven, right? Next commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. We often think this commandment to be about lying. Well, that is kind of a gist of it. But if you think about this commandment in context with the uh, the the in, in context with what is happening in the Old Testament, this is specifically talking about you know how people were brought into a courtroom and how there would be witnesses who give false um, you know they they lie in order to get people into trouble, right? This is something that happened in the Old Testament, and this commandment deals with all kinds of falsehood. Brothers and sisters, lies hurt people deeply. Right? Lying about our neighbor is one of the worst ways we can hurt them. And the end of all lies is pain and hurt. And when we keep lying, what happens? We want to lie more, right? So this commandment prohibits giving false testimony against anyone. It prohibits twisting one's word. That's something that we do naturally, right? We like to add a little bit of masala. Thanks, Philip. We like to add a little bit of masala, right? Uh, so how do we counter this? You know, in the how is this speak truth at all times? 
You know, we are called to speak truth. And the reason for that is because the God we associate with, the God we are in relationship with, He is a true God. He never lies. lies. If there is a difference between God and mankind, there are a lot of differences. One is this, that God never lies. Jesus Himself says, I am the way, the truth, and life. Right? Another thing the commandment prohibits is gossip or slander. Slander is deliberately passing along false information. It also prohibits condemning anyone rashly without enough evidence. You know, when you um, are tempted to gossip, you know, ask yourself, and this is one of the house, is it necessary to pass along this information? You know, is it necessary um, to pass this information to another person? And am I going to, what am I going to get as a result, or what do I gain of telling this particular thing about this person to another person? You know, ask yourselves these questions. Here's what the scripture says, Proverbs 6, verse 16 to 19. There are six things that the Lord hates. Okay, he hates it. Seven things that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. God hates it. And we reach the final commandment. You shall, <clears throat> you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. You know, what this commandment does not mean is that we should not notice what other people have, okay? But let's be honest, we don't stop at noticing, right? We don't stop and notice and say, Kartave, thank you for blessing this brother with all these things, right? But what we all do is we notice and stop thanking God for what we have, right? Because we want more. Coveting is not saying, you know, it'd be great, you know, if I have a house like Stephen, okay? Or, or saying, you know, it'd be great if I have a job like George Hens. <laughs> That's not coveting. Coveting is saying, I want his house and I want his job. I want, I need it. When we covet, you know, um, we think that those things will make us happy and satisfied. You know, we covet when our desires lead to or is an expression of discontentment. And finally, in Colossians 3, verse 5, we read like this, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. It basically says, I cannot live with this, I cannot live a life without this person, without these things, without those things. And the scripture says, coveting is idolatry. So how do we practice this? Firstly, you know, when we covet, we fail to love our neighbor. Okay, because when you and I are coveting, we are only thinking about us and not about them. Secondly, be content. First Timothy 6 verse 6, but godliness with contentment is of great gain. And then we can ask a few questions to see if we have a coveting heart. Whom or what do you love? What are you chasing after? What do you think about the most during your day-to-day -day lives? What is that one thing you need most in your life in order to make you really happy in life? Answering these questions will help you know what are you really thinking about, you know, what, what is in your mind. And let me tell you this, uh, anything apart from God in that blank will fail us, right? Church, another thing to remind ourselves is this, and then something that we should not be ignorant of the fact is this, that God knows what is best for you and me. Whatever you have today, is what God seems best for you. You know, be content in it. Maybe it might not be as cool as what others have, but that is what God has given you. And you are called to be stewards of what you have. So to close, I want to do two things. Help us see one question and then conclude. Why should we keep these commandments? Why should we obey these commandments? One, because it keeps us from sinning. You know, when we look at these commandments, we often think, you know, God is putting a lot of these mandates or a lot of these commandments to take our freedom away. But brothers and sisters, honestly, keeping this commandment is really freedom from sin. Don't miss that point. When we don't keep this commandment, we are sinning against God. And when we keep this commandment, we are having freedom from God. Enjoy that freedom. 
Secondly, because it is for our good. These commandments are for our good. Just think about a world where everybody kept this commandment. We wouldn't need lock in our houses, right? We wouldn't need cops, right? But the thing is, you and I cannot keep this commandment naturally. Like we said, we were born in sin. And therefore, God allows us to keep this commandment through Jesus. And it is for our good. Thirdly, it helps us to know and worship Yahweh the right way. When we keep these commandments, we get to know the very person of God and His heart and we get to worship Him the right way. And finally, this commandment helps us to witness the one and true God. When we keep these commandments, it tells the world a bigger message whom we associate with, Yahweh. Conclusion, how do we progress to keep these commandments? We progress by looking to Jesus or turning to Jesus. Brothers and sisters, trust that Jesus is our Emmanuel. Okay? He, he is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the way, the truth, and life. He tells us the truth. So we are called to listen and obey and believe in him. And that he is the only way to be forgiven. So that even when we fail to keep these commandments, which we will often fail to keep these commandments, we can run to Jesus for mercy. We can surely believe that Jesus is life and that his commandments are meant to give us life. Like we said, it keeps us from sinning so that we may follow him and have an abundant life. We progress by looking to Jesus. So to conclude, I want to go through all the Ten Commandments by illustrating to you. Commandment number one, you are to have only one God, exclusive God. Commandment number two, you have to worship God the right way. There might be things that you use that might look similar or to, you create in the image of God, but you have, to God, you have to worship only one God through Jesus. Commandment number three, if you can see my finger, it kind of shows us an alphabet, words, right? We need to be careful when we use God's name. We are not to use God's name in vain. Commandment number four, as you can see, there is one finger resting. We are called to rest and rejoice in God. Commandment number five, okay? One way you can use your five fingers is to salute, right? Honor your parents, right? Commandment number six, you are not to murder. Commandment number seven, do not commit adultery. When you commit adultery, you always commit adultery behind, back of people, right? Commandment number eight, if you look at it closely, actually it doesn't look so cool, but you kind of see that it shows like a prison bar, right? Uh, kind of. Just say yes, okay? <laughs> when you steal, you end up in prison, right? You're not to steal. Commandment number nine, do not bear false witness, okay? When we bear false witness, we always do behind the back of someone. Commandment number 10, do not covet. If the Israelites were to receive the blessings of the covenant, they were called to be obedient to his voice. If you and I are to receive God's eternal blessings, we are still called to be obedient to God's word. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for who you are. From this morning, you've been constantly reminding us of you, of, of your, uh, you know, how, how, how great you are, you know, how, how you are a holy God and that you are someone that we couldn't even reach. But Father, it encourages our hearts that just like you redeemed the people of Israelites, you brought us out of sin. People who were dead in sins and trespasses. It is not our works, it is your work and it is by grace alone. Lord, as we come into your presence this morning, as we heard from your word, your ten words for us. Father, help us not to ignore this because it's in the Old Testament, but help us to remind ourselves that this is the very commandments that God wants us to live and to be obedient to every day of our lives. And as we keep this commandment, as we learn, Father, it helps us to keep us uh, from sinning. It helps us to know you, to worship you the right way. It also helps us to witness you, 
But Father, we realize that we really don't have the strength to keep these commandments. But the strength comes from God through the power of the Spirit who works in us. So we pray that, Lord, you would help us to trust in the work of the Spirit that you would help us to sit before your word, to ask one another, to hold each other accountable so that we can walk a life being obedient to your word. Teach us, O oh Lord, to be obedient to your word. We pray this prayer through your Son and the Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen.